and um floor is yours yeah so thank you very much for having me so yep as mike said um final year student at lancaster and i'm working with dr brooke simmons who some of you might have met um on sort of the co-evolution of black holes and their host galaxies and this is currently a very active field in galaxy evolution um because it's really sort of vital to our overall understanding of galaxies as a whole. Um, if at any point anyone can't hear me, please let me know. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with a very broad outline, um, sort of covering, you know, what exactly do I mean by black hole, co-evolution, more importantly, why should we care? Um, I'll then move on to my work on far driven growth, so large scale galactic bars as a mechanism for growing black holes. And I'll finish up with the kind of physics that we can do with the next generation of surveys. So as I said, starting right at the beginning, my, bad, my very bad doodle of a galaxy. So as I'm sure you're all aware, galaxies got stars, gas dust, dark matter, but obviously we can't see the dark matter, it's invisible. And this central supermassive black hole. And you can see that broadly we can kind of decompose this galaxy structure into two Kind of key components. So we've got the, we got it. <laughs> we've all been there. So we've got the central bulge component. I've got a laser pointer. <laughs> so we've got this central bulge component. Um, and in here, the sort of orbits of the stars are sort of, they don't really lie in a preferential plane. They're kind of much more randomly distributed. Um, so we've got this dispersion supported structure. And we've got this disk shape here, um, where the orbits of the stars are much more in the same plane. Um, generally, they are more star forming, well, the, there is more star formation going on in here, not always, but yeah. But the bit that we are gonna primarily focus on today is the supermassive black hole here, not to scale. And so throughout this talk, whenever I say black hole, I am talking about supermassive black holes, not stellar mass ones, um, which has led to confusion in the past. So we don't really know much about the lifetimes of these supermassive black holes. Um, there's a rich set of theoretical predictions for how they form, but we have little to no observational evidence. But what we do think happens is they go through these periods of rapid growth and accretion, where we call them active galactic nuclei or AGN. And if you have ever done any AGN studies, you'll have seen this diagram hundreds of times. Um, and you'll also notice that it is nearly 30 years old. But actually the picture hasn't changed much for our general idea of unification of AGN. So here is a slightly more modern one, but pretty much the same. This diagram just doesn't show the radioactive, not radioactive, relativistic jets. Every single time I do that, but we, um, the general structure of an AGN is we have the supermassive black hole, which is surrounded by this accretion disk where the black hole gets its fuel from. And this is further surrounded by an obscure and dusty torus. <laughs> so it's a torus shape, it's donut shaped. Um, and the narrow and broad line regions are just named for the type of emission that we see from those regions. So obviously this is gonna look different from different angles, depending on how we look at it. So if we're looking down this kind of angle, we have a nice unobscured view of the black hole. So our, if we take a spectrum at this angle, it's gonna have both broad and narrow line components because we're not, we haven't got this torus in the way. And we call this a type one AGN because we're super inventive. But if we're looking more at this angle, we're looking through the torus, our line of sight is much more obscured and we don't see this broad line component. We only really see this narrow line component. And again, as you might be able to guess, we call this a type two AGM. And there is some discussion as to how much of the sort of dichotomy between type one and type two is down to orientation and how much is due to something more intrinsic. Um, but that is a whole talk by itself. Um, and I do not want to keep you all here for several hours. But these AGN have been observed in all types of galaxies and in galaxies of all morphologies. And we've known galaxies have different morphologies for nearly a hundred years. I'm so excited to give this talk in three years time where I can say this is a hundred years old. 
Um, but I'm sure you'll all be familiar with this as the Hubble tuning clock, which I've just updated with more modern images. So broadly speaking, on the left, we have these red electrical galaxies. So these are all bulge component, very little of this component, if any. And on the right, we've got these blue spiral galaxies. So mostly disk component, very little of any bulge component. And the spiral galaxies can further be divided into those that do and don't contain large scale bars. So probably the easiest one to see is this one. You can see it's got a bar kind of going across the center like that. Um, this is actually a stronger bar, but just because of the galaxy itself, it's slightly more difficult to pick out. Um, but kind of this is still something we can use to sort of sweepingly classify galaxy morphology. But given that this is 100 years old, things have changed a little bit. And in work led by my colleagues at Galaxy Zoo, we have been able to delve a bit deeper into some of these things that don't fit on the Hubble tuning fork. So if you're not familiar with Galaxy Zoo, it's a citizen science program and um, started in 2008, I think, um, where essentially we show members of the public pictures of galaxies and say, can you classify this? Um, and it's significantly quicker than a handful of astronomers trying to classify tens of thousands of galaxies. So if we show a galaxy to 40 of our citizen volunteers, and they will go, yes, that is a smooth and rounded galaxy, then we go, okay, cool. We're pretty sure that's a smooth and rounded galaxy. But if only sort of 75% of them say that, we can say, well, it probably is smooth and rounded, but we're less certain. So you can impose your own cutoffs for your own research, depending on what you need. But Galaxy Zoo also has our talk forum where our volunteers can go, that's weird. That's a weird galaxy there. And we got time recently with Hubble as part of a snapshot program to identify, or not identify, to investigate further some of these galaxies that didn't fit on the tuning fork. And this is a program called Zoo Gems that was led by my colleague, um, Bill Keel. And the paper is just described as we have a bunch of galaxies that are weird and look, we've got better data on them. Um, so it's a really fun paper to read if you want to check it out. But the other thing that Galaxy Zoo can do is help us conduct our own science. So when, if you're not an observationalist, um, this bit might be useful. So when we want to see a galaxy's morphology, it's got to be observed with a type of resolution that means we can pick out morphological features. If we just see a blob, previously we've had to rely on color and go, well, that's a blue blob. We can't resolve out the individual features, but if it's blue, it's probably a disk galaxy. If it's red, it's probably an elliptical. And we've known that things like red disks and blue ellipticals have existed for a number of years. Um, Masters 2010 did a whole study on these red disks. But actually our volunteers at Galaxy Zoo were finding so many of these red disks and these blue ellipticals that in 2022, in a paper led by my colleagues, um, Rebecca Sledis and Karen Masters, we actually sort of did a deeper study on this and realized that red disks and blue ellipticals are so common that sadly we can't really accurately use color as a proxy for morphology, which is a problem, but it's now at least a problem that we know exists. But AGN have been observed in all of these types of galaxies. But actually, not only can all of these galaxies host growing black holes, they all appear to co-evolve with their black holes. So there is a really, really well-developed review by Comedy and Ho, um, which I would check out if you're interested, but it is 130 pages. So only if you're really interested. But um, here I'm showing a couple of graphs from there. So we've got the black hole mass on the y-axis. On the first x-axis, we've got the luminosity of the bulge in the k-band. And on the second x-axis, we've got the stellar velocity dispersion inside the effective radius that encompasses half the light of the bulge. And we can see that these kind of tight correlations do exist. Um, and actually, the more canonical relationship we tend to use is a bit older, but it's still um, that holds up very well, um, is this Herring and Ricks relationship. And they used elliptical galaxies, so all bulge component, no disk component. And they found that the mass of the black hole correlates with the stellar mass of the bulge. 
Um, but bear in mind that because they're using elliptical galaxies, this bulge mass is equivalent to the total stellar mass. And at first, this sounds obvious. Bigger stuff lives in bigger things. But let's analyze this deeper. So black holes are some of the most dense gravitationally bound objects in the universe. Galaxies, some of the least dense. The galaxies are hundreds of thousands of light years across. Black holes, maybe a handful of AU. It, and if you look at the masses as well, like the mass of the black hole is maybe 0.1 to 1% the stellar mass of the galaxy. There's no logical reason that the galaxy should care about the black hole. But we very clearly see this color evolution. So what's driving this? Well, it's got to be something that affects the black hole and the galaxy at the same time. And so for many years, it was thought that mergers, so two galaxies merging, was driving this relationship. So when we have two galaxies merging, as I'm showing here, um, is the video playing? Yes, cool. Um, we've had issues with that before. Um, all the angular momentum in the two galaxies is being redistributed. We've got gas and material and dust flying everywhere where it can easily be accreted onto the black hole. And you'll notice as these two merge that they form a central bulge. That will become important later. And it is true that some populations of AGN, these actively growing black holes, are predominantly hosted in mergers. So radio loud red quasars, just a subset of AGN, do predominantly exist in mergers. But it turns out, as you might have guessed from the title of the talk, that mergers are not the only cause of coevolution. So I mentioned that when we have two galaxies merging, we form a central bulge. This galaxies grow from the sort of much more calm accretion of gas from their wider environment. And it accretes this in maybe slightly minor mergers without disrupting the disk. So we form without a bulge. And studies such as Martin et al. 2012 have used simulations to show that where we have a very low bulge to total ratio, um, then the fraction of baryons from mergers, so the stuff in the galaxy from mergers, is also very low. And this is a one-sided relationship. So we can have no stuff from mergers, but bulges growing from other means. But observationally, we need disk-dominated galaxies to isolate our merger-free regime. So if we see AGN in disdominated galaxies, we know they haven't been grown through mergers because AGN are very short-lived objects, relatively. And surprise, surprise, we see AGN in merger-free galaxies. So this has been observed in countless works. So Simmons et al, 2011, 2013, Chavinsky 2011. We know very much that these exist. But it also turns out that not only does a merger-free pathway exist, Surprisingly, it's actually the dominant pathway. So um, in a study by Martin et al, 2018, they used the Horizon AGM simulation to show that mergers are only responsible for maybe 35% of supermassive black hole growth. And the other 65 is due to merger-free processes. And actually, more recent studies, such as McCall Pine et al, 2020, showed that the contribution from the merger-free component could be as high as 85%. So clearly it's very, very important that we understand this merger-free pathway in order to understand co-evolution between black holes and galaxies as a whole. So the first thing we wanted to do was look at whether, well, the first thing we as a field wanted to do, this was before I started my PhD, is see whether the black holes growing through mergers were any different to those grown through merger-free processes. And the short answer, as shown by Simmons, Smethers, and Lintot in 2017, is not really. So here we're looking at the total stellar mass, because in a disdominated galaxy, we're not going to have a bulge component. And in red, I'm showing the Herring and Ricks relationship from before. And we can see that Simmons, Smethers, and Lintop, the relationship they found using disk dominated, so merger free galaxies, is actually consistent with the Herring and Ricks relationship. Um, there is a slight offset there, possibly due to the fact the two studies used different methods to measure their black hole mass. Um, and the only other thing to notice is that 
sort of we can only well, we can go back holes up to ten to the nine solar masses or so. So maybe the most massive black holes do require mergers, but predominantly we can grow most black holes using merger-free processes. However, this is just one study. And also Simmons is my supervisor, so I'm probably a bit biased. So let's look at some other studies. And oh no, the picture got grim. So in the purple line here, I'm showing the herring and Rick's relationship. In the black dashes, we've got the Simmons fit from the last slide. But these two other studies, Bernert and then Rhines, also looked at black holes in this dominated galaxies. And they found that they weren't consistent with merger-driven growth. <laughs> so what is going on here? Well, my colleague, Matt Thorne, um, is currently writing up his paper on this. Um, but he has shown through simulations, paying careful attention to the selection function, that actually all of these samples are consistent with being drawn from the same parent sample. And that the barometric luminosity is actually a better measure of whether things are co-evolving than not. And Matt is currently writing up his results, um, but he has shown that the relationship we see in Simmons, Feathersome, Lintop is real, but it is not part, or it's not the whole picture. So clearly we need to do a lot more work. And this is why I'm doing a PhD. So I'm looking at whether large scale galactic stars, such as those that were, oh, yep, cool. Such as those that were down here on the Hubble tuning fork, whether these can help us to grow black holes in the absence of mergers. And studies have done this before. So here I'm showing a plot from Silver Lima et al, 2022. And they showed that the AGN fraction is higher in a sample of barred galaxies than in a sample of unbarred. But look at these error bars. The problem is the error bars on studies that have previously been done are so high that we seem to be hinting at this kind of tantalizing result. There might be something there, but we can't really say with any statistical certainty what's going on. <laughs> so I am attempting to control for um, variables that affect both AGN and bar presence. And then I can see if the bar presence by itself is having an effect. So I'm using the same sample that was first collated in, in Simmons, Smethers, and Lintop. So we know that coevolution is happening in these galaxies. And it's a sample of disk dominated luminous type one AGN, so our unobscured AGN. And we know that bars can, and AGN, both correlate with variables such as star formation rate and stellar mass. Um, so here's just an example plot from Masters and Hall 2011 showing that bar fraction um, okay. correlates with color. So I need to control for star formation rate and stellar mass. And the issue we have with the parent sample is that most of them have SDSS fiber spectra. Um, so if you're not an observationalist, a fiber spectrum kind of takes everything within this yellow aperture and collapses it down to a one-dimensional spectrum, which if we didn't have an AGN there, we'd be away. But the light from the AGN is very clearly going to contaminate the light from the host galaxy here. And decomposing AGN and galaxy emission is incredibly challenging if you're working with fiber spectra. Um, and actually something like long slit spectra are better. So if we have a long slit spectrum, we take a long slit over the galaxy here, and then we can place apertures over the slit once we've taken the data. So if I place an aperture here, I could just have the light from the AGM. Or if I place an aperture here, I could just get the light from the galaxy. And this means, so I like collapse everything in here down to a one dimensional spectrum, and I collapse everything in here down to a one dimensional spectrum. And this gives me two distinct spectra from the same long slit observation. So I've got my AGN spectrum and my galaxy spectrum that both came from that galaxy. So again, if, you don't, if you're not used to seeing um, sort of these kinds of plots, in black, we've got the reduced spectrum. The blue here is a fitted continuum. 
And these Gaussians are all just emission lines that we find in this region. So I'm focusing here on the H alpha N2 region. And you'll notice because these are type 1 AGNs, they've got this very broad H alpha emission line here that's not present in the galaxy. So by separating out our AGN and our galaxy emission, we can obtain much more accurate fits to the H alpha emission. And from H alpha, we can get the star formation rate. Um, I can go a bit more in detail as to how exactly we do that um, decomposition, but mm. the ins and outs are not something you want to hear if you're not really, really into spectral analysis. So what about the stellar mass? Well, we wanted to use um, data from the MPAJHU catalog, which takes it from SDS SDR7. But again, we've got this problem of this whopping great big AGM. So these are all SDSS images, and this AGN in each of them is a point source. But because SDSS is ground-based, and well, I think it first started taking observations in 2000 or something, um, the PSF is very high, the point spread function. So this makes the light from the AGN spread out. And actually, we got HST data in a snapshot program for some of these galaxies. So if we see these same nine galaxies in HST, suddenly the point source looks a lot more pointy. Mm -hmm. And my colleague, Matt Fahey, for his master's thesis, took all of the HST images that we have and used Galfit to fit these images. And Galfit will give us the magnitude of the central PSF, and that will give us the magnitude of the system as a whole. And this means we can assume that all, well, we can assume that all the light in the PSF is due to AGN because the AGN is so bright. And then we can work out the fraction of the flux of the system that is due to the AGN, and therefore the fraction of the flux of the system that is due to the galaxy. And we can take these fractions, apply them to our MPAJHU colors, and obtain stellar mass. Yay! The technical hitch is we don't have HST data for all of our SDSS images. And we cannot do this procedure using SDSS images because the PSF is so large. So we would overestimate the contribution from the AGN. And just to show this graphically, if you calculate the fraction of the flux that's due to the PSF in Hubble, we have that on the y-axis. And if you do the same calculation using SDSS, it's on the x-axis. And in an ideal world, if everything we observed was not contaminated by optical effects, all of these points would lie on this line of equivalence. And the blue points are for where I have real Hubble data. And the red points are from where I could fit a running median to this SDSS Hubble data and kind of estimate what the fraction of the flux would be due to the PSF if it was observed in HST. And because all of these points are below this line of equivalence, this is a very clear thing that you should give me high resolution space-based data. Um, so like we've got Euclid now. <laughs> So we can essentially figure out the fraction of the flux that is due to the galaxy and apply it to our Sloan colors. And this means that for our sample of AGN in disdominated galaxies, we can plot it on the star formation rate stellar mass relationship in red, in the red crosses. And I can get a comparison sample of inactive disks, so no AGN, um, from Galaxy Zoo 2, which are shown in the blue contours. And you can immediately see by looking at this that clearly we're going to need to do some controlling for things. So the AGN hosts very clearly occupy a different regime <laughs> of color, no, of star formation rate mass space. And this could be real. It could be that we need higher mass galaxies to host AGN. But it could also be a selection effect. So we are looking at the most luminous type 1 AGN. Now, if everything is Eddington luminous, that means we're looking at the most massive black holes. And we already know, because coevolution is happening, that the most massive black holes have to line the most massive galaxies. The other issue is we want things that are very, very clearly disk dominated, which means we need to be able to see the disk. 
Um, and that means the disc needs to be big enough on the sky that we can see it under the lights on the AGM. So this could explain why we have this really, really high stellar mass. So before even looking at the bar presence, there is quite a lot of discrepancy in the field about sort of what AGM do to star formation rate or what star formation rate, how that affects AGM. So before even considering bars, I just controlled for stellar mass and I wanted to look at the star formation rate. So here is a histogram of the samples, both control and mass of the star formation rate. And we performed KS tests on these two samples. So a KS test is just a statistical test that measures how likely it is two samples are drawn from the same parent sample. So if we get high p-values above 0.05, is considered high for this case, which is what we've got here, then we can assume that the two samples are consistent with being drawn from the same parent sample. So looking at this plot, we can see that the star formation rate um, for the active and inactive galaxies is consistent with being drawn from the same parent sample. And this could be because by the time we had been able to do our spectral fitting, um, some of our galaxies we could only obtain upper limits in H alpha, and therefore upper limits on star formation rate, and we wanted to ignore those for now. We only had 34 AGM in this sample. <laughs> um, so it could be that we're just seeing these similarities, this low statistical significance, because I'm only working with mm -hmm. 34 AGM. But it could also be potentially due to outflows. Now, about half of this sample show evidence of AGN outflows in their O3 emission. And in a study led by Becky Sledders, we got um, KCWI time on Keck and for a pilot study of four galaxies. So looking at this middle row here, the blue um, is indicative of ionization due to AGN activity, so outflows. And the red is due to ionization from star formation. And you can see that the outflow in every case reaches the edge of the galaxy. Now, as you've got an outflow traveling through a galaxy, at the front of the outflow, we are compressing cold gas. We're making cold gas more dense. Where we've got dense cold gas, we get stars, increased star formation. But in the wake of the outflows it's traveling through, we've blown all the cold gas out of the galaxy. No cold gas, no stars. And really high resolution IFU data for a larger sample would help us to kind of uncover this picture a bit more. Okay, but then I was told by my supervisor I needed to get back to my original aim of looking at bar presence. So remember we need to control for stellar mass and star formation rate in order to analyze the effect of bars. So I control for both of those and then I look at the um, stellar mass, once we split both samples from active barred, active non-barred, inactive barred, inactive non-barred. So <clears throat> if we didn't split, there would be one red and one blue histogram, and they would be identical. And they are, I did check. But even when we split, I then did KS tests comparing every combination of these samples. And in every case, they were consistent with being drawn from the same parent sample. And the picture is very much the same when we look at star formation rate as well. So this gives us very little insight into the effects of bars combined with AGN activity on the wider variables of the galaxy. But the main result from our paper was, um, which is Garland Dissolve 2023, if anyone is interested in this in more detail, is that once we control for these samples and we analyze the bar fraction in our AGN hosts compared to our bar fraction in our inactive sample, AGN hosts are more likely to host a bar than the inactive sample. So it would appear that there is a correlation. However, again, I have ridiculously high error bars. So I've gone, I've fallen into the same problem that previous studies have, where there's this tantalizing hint at a result <clears throat> but I can't say anything with any statistical certainty. So really, this means you should give me more data. Scientifically, you should give me data. Um, and I know a lot of astronomy problems pose give data as the solution, but in this case, the problem is a little more complex. 
AGN are not common objects, and nor are completely disdominated galaxies. And we need completely disdominated galaxies, observationally, to rule out a history of mergers. And finding the two together is incredibly challenging. And it's not so challenging that the next generation of surveys, such as DESI or Euclid, won't be able to help us make very drastic strides in this. But with this sample, 34 AGN is not enough. So what we can do is we can turn to simulations because the bonus of using simulations such as Horizon AGN is we don't need galaxies to be completely bolterless to get their merger history. So in work led by my colleagues, Rebecca Smethers and Ricardo Beckman, um, we split a sample of black holes in galaxies into merger free and merger driven. And we looked at their co-evolution relation. This time we're looking at black hole mass to stellar velocity dispersion. And we showed that the correlations are applicable to both data sets. But not only that, these correlations are independent of the bulge to total stellar mass shown in the color bar. And this similarity is really actually quite surprising because in a companion study, also led by um, Ricardo and Becky, we looked at the black hole spin. And this is something we can really at the moment only do on a large scale with simulations, um, on a large scale specifically. So A here is the absolute um, alignment of the black hole and the galaxy. So if we've got a value of one, um, that means that the black hole and the galaxy are either spinning in the same plane or kind of in the same plane, but different directions, but their poles are aligned. If we've got a absolute value of five, their poles are at 90 degrees to each other. And in the gray, we've got our merger driven sample. And in the purple, we've got our merger free sample. And you can clearly see that our merger free um, galaxies are much more likely to be either completely aligned or completely anti-aligned with their host galaxies than the merger driven counterparts. And this is a really strong result. We see this result to five sigma. So this is just showing what we can do with large data sets. Um, and if you want more information about how spin and agent feedback are correlated, um, Davey et al. 2019 have got a really nice paper using similar simulations, but I'm looking at the time and I don't have time to go into that right now. Um, so given that we've shown what we can do with these copious <coughs> amounts of data, what are the next generation of surveys going to do for us? Well, my conclusion to my last part was give me more data. I got data. So in a project led by my colleague, Mike Wormsley, who's at Toronto, we used Galaxy Zoo to identify the morphologies of all 8.7 million galaxies in the DESI legacy surveys. And these mimic our citizen science classifications. However, if we'd used traditional Galaxy Zoo methods, at current classification rates, it would take about 200 years. And I would quite like to get a paper on this out before my 200th birthday hypothetically. But this meant with a morphology on such a great scale, I could very easily select samples of this dominated galaxies. And I could also classify their bar strength into strongly barred, weakly barred, and unbarred. Now, the problem here is I do still need SDSS imaging here, because we need to identify their AGN presence. And we do this using BPT diagrams, which again, if you do AGN studies, you'll have seen hundreds of these, and I'm sorry. But if they're not something you're familiar with, we use emission line ratios. So O3, H beta, N2, H alpha, S2, and O1. And we look at the ratios of these to classify the activity level of a galaxy. So first of all, it needs enough emission that we can classify it. So for this work, we said a galaxy that we're going to classify the activity of has to have a signal to noise ratio of at least three in these four emission lines. Once we've got that, if we don't have that, we classify it as undetermined, which just means there's not much emission there. Now, not much emission, this galaxy, probably a red spiral. But if we do have enough emission to classify them, we can classify them using a hierarchical system um, as either AGN, star forming, 
composite, so a mix of AGN and star forming activity, or liners, which are low ionization nuclear emission regions, not AGN. Um, so once we've got these classifications, um, we removed composite and liner galaxies from our sample just to avoid confusion. So I can have a sample of AGN, sample of star forming, and a sample of undetermined, all with bar classifications. And this gives me 3.8 thousand AGN, which is slightly more than 34. So maybe I can do statistics now, yes? Yes, I can. So I looked at the activity fractions in different bar categories. So red is AGN, blue is star forming, gray is undetermined. And we can see looking at this, that strongly barred galaxies are much more likely to host AGN than weakly barred or unbarred galaxies. But not only that, look at these error bars. We're finally getting results that have some statistical significance. We've got much more um, kind of certainty that, okay, strongly barred <laughs> galaxies are more likely to host AGN. They are driving this correlation. And now that we've got this, we wanted to see how this was um, affected over the, or how this changed over color mass space. So there's a lot going on in this diagram. Um, so I will take you through it. So on the y-axis, we've got color. On the x-axis, we've got stellar mass. For this example, I'm just comparing star forming, no, strongly barred and unbarred galaxies and AGN to not AGN. So kind of um, some sort of combination of star forming and undetermined galaxies. Now our black contours show the entire sample of face-on disc-dominated galaxies, face-on so we can see their bar -ness. And the 2D histogram shows the fraction of strong bars that host AGN minus the fraction of unbarred galaxies that host AGN. And if I lost you a bit there, because it's quite statistically intense, green means strong bars are more likely to host AGN at that color and mass. Purple means unbarred galaxies are more likely. And there is no purple. At every color and mass combination, strongly barred galaxies are driving the correlation that we see. And I know that some people here are thinking, well, what if this is just, you got really lucky with your binning choice. So we did it again. And we did it again. And we did it again. And in every case, it is coming up that strongly barred galaxies are more likely to host AGN than their unbarred counterparts. And for each binning combination, we did this from five to 17 bins in each direction. We found the average value of the differences in AGN fraction. So here that would be what kind of 0.15%. And we found the fraction of bins where strongly barred galaxies were more likely to host an AGN than unbarred galaxies. So here that would be 100%. And we did this for strongly barred versus unbarred, strongly barred, barred versus weak barred, and weakly barred versus unbarred. And we plotted them. So um, if you do five by five, five by six, five by seven, all the way up to 17 by 17, you get 169 different bin combinations. And this dot dashed line represents what we would expect these histograms to center around if there was no difference in the likelihood of different bar categories to host an AGN. So we'd expect the average difference between the AGN fractions to be zero we'd expect the average fraction of bins where the stronger bar category is dominant to be half. And the further rightward any of these histograms are, the more likely it is that the stronger barred category, so strong versus unbarred would be strong, weak barred versus unbarred would be weak barred. The more likely it is that the stronger bar category is more likely to host an AGN. And we can see with very clear results really, really strong bars are driving this correlation. But weak bars are still slightly more likely than unbarred galaxies to host an AGN at all colors and masses. And this result was whipped up into a paper and submitted to Munras um, a couple of weeks ago. So hopefully should be out in the next couple of months. Um, and this is showing what we can do with DESI. Imagine what we can do with Euclid. Give me Euclid data. 
So the take home points I want you to take from this talk before I run over, because I'm so close to almost on time, is firstly, we don't understand merger-free black hole growth. The second point is that when we use a small sample, um, AGN host galaxies were shown to be more likely to host a bar than inactive counterparts. But with a bigger sample, it's very clear that strong bars are driving a, def a definite AGN bar correlation. So developing our understanding of how AGN are triggered in the absence of mergers and potentially in the future, how feedback can affect the host galaxy is vital to our understanding of galaxy evolution. And these upcoming large surveys, such as Euclid and LSST, are going to be really, really revolutionary. Thank you very, very much for listening to me today. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Do we got time for questions? Oh. Uh, if somebody came up with a hypothesis, say um, mergers or um, strong mergers, one to one mergers, one to two, that kind of stuff, uh, produces AGM with an addition uh, fraction above 0.1, and uh, the, the circular gas inflow driven by the, by the bar. Produce AGN with an addition ratio less than point one. Could you address such a hypothesis? So I would really like X-ray data to investigate accretion rates of black holes. Um, ideally something like Erosita data, but obviously that's not available at the moment. Um, so I'm wondering if XMM has enough data to do something like that and investigate the accretion rates. If it does, I think that with these large surveys such as DESI, the problem is bulges can exist, not necessarily just through mergers. There are other things that can form bulges. So we could identify a sample of merger free, but I don't observationally know how you could identify something that's merger driven unless it's got remnants of recent tidal interactions in it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There is a very large catalog of interacting galaxies that we could potentially use, um, which was developed by one of my colleagues, David Orion. I think it is something that is addressable. I have no idea what the results would be. I want to know. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I was going in the direction of, did you estimate the edit fraction for the sample? We didn't, no. No. Um, bonus of now we've got results with such statistical significance is that we can now start picking out the subtleties. Um, so as Mike mentioned, I'm on the job market and my fellowship applications are all very, oh, your university works with this data. Here's what I'll do with that. Um, and investigating how bar strength maybe affects Eddington ratio would be awesome. Thank you. Look at your first take home point. I'm thinking, is it really fully understood? I mean, so you know, there is a story about black hole growth being the result of mergers, but we all know that's not true. I mean, this is a bit of a dead horse at this point, isn't it? When you, if you, if you have a, if you can organize to have some fraction of the gas that goes into the star, a really big quantity fraction of our star, which is like the definition of black hole resources. Yeah. Right? Is that a fair statement or is there more to it than that? It's nice to be able to identify systems where that must be happening, which is what you're doing, but is it really fully understood? Are there other questions driving in a different direction? From so that? from simulations that I've seen, bars are very capable of driving gas down to the central killer parsec. How it gets from that central killer parsec to the black hole is, from what I know, less well understood. If you have references on more than that, please share them with me. Um, but the actual sort of physics and the dynamics going on in that central killer parsec is not greatly understood from my understanding. Um, there is work going on at Newcastle, I think, who've got JWST data to look at the central parsec. So hopefully some really interesting stuff's gonna come out of that. Um, but as far as I'm aware, yeah, we can get gas down to the center, how it then actually gets onto the, and accreted by the black hole. At least personally, I'm not so sure of the physics of it. Mm. So it's the, it's the specific process of the driver down. Yeah. To, to be fair, we don't, 
actually know what loads of green merges is there. I just assume that it was all in that too. So oh, like, fair enough. Get stuff in there. That's, 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 that's the problem with the ballot. So overall, black hole growth is poorly understood. Um. So so what? Well, you were saying that the AGMs form more regularly and prefer. There's a correlation between the AGM and the bar mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. So what 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 is that process? What is making that? So that is an excellent question. Um is currently the answer. I'm okay. not sure. <laughs> um there's sort of three well, no, it is absolutely not. It is what is meaning I will hopefully have a job at some point in the future. So there's kind of three potential things that could be happening. One is the bar is Funneling the bars can alter angular momentum. They can funnel gas down to the center where it can be accreted onto a black hole. That would trigger an AGM. One is that, right, there's a paper, um, Eva Locus did a 2022 paper using simulations showing that feedback from an AGM can induce um, instabilities in a disk, which would trigger a bar to form. So it could be that the AGN are causing bars to form. Um, the third option is there is some other thing that triggers both an AGN and a bar, but they're not directly linked. So that could be, uh, is there a flyby? Like, is there another galaxy flying past, which is causing an instability, um, so tidal disruption and triggering a bar, and also causing changes of gas within the galaxy that trigger an AGN. Um, I'm hoping with something like Euclid, with a wide field of view, we could control for environment and answer that third point. Really, I think simulations are going to be needed to distinguish between the other two. Um, I'm very much not a simulations person. There is a paper on the archive at the moment that is on my to read list that uses illustrious T and G and finds very similar results to what I found in the paper I've just submitted to Munras, um, that there is a correlation between AGM and strong bars. So potentially we could use th those results to tease out why that correlation exists. But the short answer is we have no idea. Could the, uh, could the simulation show that there's a, a link between the size of the AGM, uh, oh, sorry, the size of the black hole, for example, and the, the bar, so that that might help? Potentially. Um, very much potentially, yes. Um, so, because obviously the bonus of simulations is we can get various parameters with much more certainty. Um, so that is definitely something that I think could be done by people who are better at simulations than me. <laughs> um, but it'd be very interesting to talk to people at Illustrious about that, or potentially people at Horizon AGM as well. It would be very useful with that. Problem is we're not, uh, from what I can know, we're not great at accurately simulating on a large scale, AGM feedback or bar formation. We can do it on a very small scale, but not wide other. Okay, thank you. Do we know how we can bar? How well do we know how bar is So there are varying theories. Um, Geron et al. 2023 have a paper on that. And also the, Tobias, so Tobias Geron has a 2021 paper on that as well. Um, and that work shows that potentially strong and weak bars form in different ways. Um, one is disk instabilities and one is tidal interactions, and I cannot remember which. Um, but generally, if there's an instability in a disk, um, it causes a bar to form. The more specifics of that, I would check out Tobias's papers. There's probably others as well, but those are the ones I know. How is it like an open question or... That's that's something that you can be considered as settled. I wouldn't say it's settled. Okay. The bars can form in different ways. Yeah. So, yeah, by, by both of those mechanisms. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's what's very important. It's not it's not like it's a complete mystery. Yeah. We have strong ideas. Uh, yeah.
Oh, you've got the um m equals two Fourier mode, something. Um, again, bar dynamics are not particularly my specialty. <laughs> there's, there's, there's stuff out there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And there's plenty of AGN in unbarred systems, um, or at least not in systems with bars that we can detect. They might have very small bars that we can't see. So we still don't have the answer to the whole picture. We never will, hopefully, because then I'll have a job. Yes. So the spin parameters, they tell you No, I understand that. I'm just not sure that this, that the spin, magnitude, spin parameter, etc. I have always thought these were separate quant quantities. So it's like so they are separate quantities. Um, this paper does talk about the magnitude of so how fast the black hole is spinning and what angle it's spinning out. It does talk about both, and it finds that in merger free grown black holes grown in the absence of mergers the spin is also faster the spin magnitude is higher um and the whole thing about mergers affecting the spin is really interesting um but yeah, we don't have i want observational evidence of this as well um because we like both simulation yeah yeah, so exactly. You know, um, anything to do with particles of black holes is a bit like yes, yeah, so because obviously like like, you like, need the cells to be so small. You can't be, you can't be oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the fact we see this such high sort of certainty indicates that at least at the resolutions we're looking at here, this is what we're seeing. Um, and this is why I really want more high resolution x-ray data because that's how we can get observational spins and then hopefully use that to influence simulations and to clear up the picture even more. One more question. Yeah. Uh, sorry I missed this, but are your um are bars more likely in higher stellar mass galaxies? Bars yes bars are more likely in higher stellar mass galaxies. Um you didn't miss it I didn't have that on there specifically. Um like these ones yeah um yeah bars do correlate with stellar mass they are more common at higher stellar mass as are AGN as far as we know although Ed 2012 maybe 2015 says that could just be AGN that we can detect um so yeah there's a lot of needing to control for stellar mass and color and in the just plain and simple bar charts here we did control for stellar mass and color before measuring the um yeah, yeah. So there's no interaction. Yeah. 